Hey guys, you're watching The Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And today I've got my special friend on, who's an amazing restorative dentist and a great teacher. And we're going to talk about affordable, complete care dentistry with Dr. Ian Buckle from the Dawson UK. Do not miss this. Do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best of Practices show. We're so grateful you're watching and thank you for all of your comments and all of your suggestions. Uh, again, up to over 16,000 followers in just you know three short months and quarter million views a week and over 6,000 of you have found this on iTunes and um, just, just crazy, crazy grateful. So thank you for all your suggestions and your shares and everything. And um, we are gonna try to do our best to get you everything that you're asking for. And today, again, no exception. We're gonna be talking about affordable, complete care dentistry and how we do that with my good friend, Dr. Ian Buckle from Dawson, UK, and you will love him. Uh, so before we get started, a couple show notes. We are shooting this live on Facebook. So as you have questions, feel free to add the questions to the feed, and then I'll ask Ian directly, and we'll get the answers straight from the guy um, who's our master today. And then also, if you're watching this later after the live feed, continue to add questions, and we'll get you the right questions, because we want to make sure these are hugely, hugely valuable in your life and your practice. Now, my guest today, um, good friend of mine, I swear we could talk about anything, buddy, you know, just anything, whether it be food, having fun, uh, I just enjoy your company. And so I had a good chance to uh, to come over there and, and and be a part of the Dawson movement that you guys have in the UK, and, and you and your wife were so gracious. I just had a great time. Uh, but if people don't know who Dr. Ian Buckle is, can you just tell them a little bit about your story and who you are and, and where you came from and how you got involved in the Dawson Academy? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, thanks for having me back, Kirk. You know, and it's good to chat with you. It's a good way of spending some time with you. So this is great. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, I, I, I'm a general dentist. I, I work in the northwest of England. I, I'm originally from Liverpool. We're just across the bay uh, on a little place in the world. We have a, a nice practice there. And we also have, as you say, Dawson Academy UK. Um, so we hold all the Dawson Academy core curriculum courses there. And I, I also do some courses in uh, composite and uh, digital dentistry and those sort of things as well. Uh, but I'm just a normal dentist. I uh, run the practice. I've got the same challenges that everyone else has. You know, my practice manager is on maternity leave at the moment, which in the UK is about five years. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, my, my main assistant has just been in uh, India for, for six months. So she's just come back. So, so now we're sort of getting back on track. So, because the, Dentistry is the perhaps the easy part. It's it, running the practice and the patients is the is the tricky thing. So, so we got those things going on, but we you know, we also spend part of our time teaching as well. Uh, you know, and it's it's so rewarding to be able to do that. But my my journey really started uh, a number of years ago. You know, you're always trying to sort of be the best dentist I could be. Really, and it was uh, it wasn't so easy back in those days. There was much less uh, in the way of uh, uh, continuing courses. Uh, and I, you know, to cut the long story short, I eventually came across John Cranham. John came over and did his lecture on the cosmetic occlusal connection. We, we were sort of just going to get hit by the great uh, cosmetic wave that you all sent over to us. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, I heard this message of beautiful dentistry done in a predictable way uh, with a philosophy of care. And, and, and that was something that really uh, struck home with me. Uh, and so... You know, I did a lot of cosmetic dentistry. I learned a lot about that. Uh, being European, I like uh, minimally invasive dentistry and I like uh, adhesion. So we were able to sort of combine those things. And and through that, you know, we sort of, and then when I when John became clinical director at Dawson Academy, I sort of got involved there. And it's been a great pleasure to be able to be involved in developing the courses and, and, and involved with teaching and, and to see what we've all achieved. Uh, in Pete's name, really, you know, because of course, if it wasn't for Pete, none of us would be doing this probably. No, Absolutely. And, 
You know, and the, the, the interesting thing is, I think most of us would feel the same, is that you sit down and you try and write it in a different way, you know, some the new way. And you mm. keep realizing that there's a, still a backbone that runs through it, which is what Pete wrote 40 something years ago. Um, right. And, uh, you know, one of my, uh, uh, the, I wrote an article a little while ago called Trends Versus Timeless Principles. And, and you know, we get a lot of the the trends that come along. So at, in the moment in the UK, we've got all the DSD stuff. We've got GDP orthodontics. Um, we've got all those things going on, like we've had cosmetics, etc. But now, I mean, the, the thing that never goes away is if we understand complete care dentistry, if we understand what that is and we understand the concepts, then we can then we can choose the materials and procedures that's most appropriate for our patients. And, you know, I, I think particularly today uh, when we're trying to use composite, when we're trying to use uh, um, little pieces of porcelain to solve the patient's problems and to make them look great, I think understanding how to manipulate the forces that work on them is so very very important you know so that's why i i i really think that combining pete's principles with uh obviously with the the modern materials and the modern theories and technology that we have today gives us tremendous power you know so yeah Absolutely. And I love this conversation. And I think one of the things that we have to do is really define what complete care is. And this isn't, you know, just, you know, a full mouth, you know, rehabilitation. Can you really give some, give some good definition of what complete care is? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of tell you sort of my, my, my way of explaining it, if you like, which, you know, right. I, I mean, you know, people always tell you, and I was, I was very fortunate. I have dinner with him a few months ago and, and he, and he explained it to me again about how he came up with the idea I know if you think about one of the ways of thinking about complete care is it's the opposite of incomplete care, you know, mm, and that's good, you know, and, uh, but I stole that from Pete. So I, I, I give you my own thing on it now is, you know, we, we, we all like teeth, you know, we like, we, we, you know, we like the biology, we like perio stuff, you know, we know that we need to deal with any cancer and things, you know, that's so important. It touches all our lives. And, you know, we know that a lot of our patients want, beautiful, beautiful smiles. You know, that's a lot why a lot of them comes in. But the piece of the pie that we often miss is the bit with occlusion and TMJ and and and, and understanding how if we're going to make these teeth look great and stay healthy, how do we make all this fit together so that it's going to be long-term healthy, that it's going to be uh, as aesthetic as the patient would like it to be, and it's going to function correct for them, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's trying to complete the uh, is about trying to make all those things fit together. And it's about it's about acting as the patient's advocate to use your knowledge and your experience to try and help them develop what they would like. You know, but when patients ask you for a beautiful smile, they expect it to be healthy. They expect it to last. They expect right. it to be able to speak, you know? And I think sometimes we we take the easy way out and say, well, the patient wanted this or the patient wanted that. But I think we've got to remember that we're professionals as well, and we, we we should deliver health and function at the same time as as cosmetic stuff. Um, they, they, I mean, the other thing is, I mean, a lot of my patients have been drilled. We have been drilled and filled a lot over the years, and we got structural issues. How do you put them back together so it's all going to work well and to last as long as possible? You know? Yeah, and and absolutely, and this goes with um, defining kind of where you're, you're not in a super super wealthy part of the UK where people come in and they just have a lot of discretionary dollars for dentistry. I mean, a lot of times you're putting the puzzle together for them with all the, whether it be, uh, you know, biology, aesthetics, function, structure, finances, all of this. And it's, it's a puzzle you put together with them, right? No, I, absolutely. You know, it's a, and it's about understanding the patients. And, you know, one of the reasons why I particularly wanted to talk about this is was perhaps one of the biggest mistakes that I made when I, when I, when I heard this message of complete care, because, you know, all of a sudden you got so excited about all these things that you could do and you'd say to the patient, OK, so we can do this for you. And that's 20,000 pounds. And they would say, oh, could you print that estimate for me? I'll speak to my husband and you know what that means. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right. And whereas, you know, one of the one of the messages that we really want to get across them is, is, you know, we're here for you and we're here to do this in a, in a manner that's appropriate for you and in a time scale that's appropriate for you. And, you know, sending one of the messages that I try and get across is that we can, you know, I'd rather, co I'd rather compromise on the time that we take than the quality of what we do. So being able to 
get someone set up well so that maybe over time we could get them to this uh, state where the, everything is in great shape, then that's going to be a real service that we can that offer to people. Uh, otherwise, you know, you know, we do have some patients that come in, they know what we do, they want the whole deal, if you like, and they pay you a certain amount of money. And, you know, it's very nice, uh, but it's sort of, it's not my favorite thing. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's also got limited application because a lot, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a, from a working class background. I like normal people, you know, I, I, so I, I want to be able to, so I think it's important that you have a philosophy in your practice and in your life and, you know, for your dentistry and, and, and so our philosophy is that we want to just provide care for anyone who wants a, a, a great looking smile and keep themselves healthy for the rest of their life. And, but that then provides challenges because not everyone, you know, I, I stole this from Wilkerson, you know, but I always say a lot of people have got Buckles disease, which means they've got lots of problems and not so much money, you know? <laughs> so, right. so how, how do we help them? And, right. and, and, you know, and to understand as well, that some of these patients might have a lot of problems, but it might not be the right time for them. And that, that we don't want to make them feel as though they don't belong in the practice, that we want to have them feel as though, you know what, we'll take care of you. We'll take care of the biology. We'll look after you. And when the time is right, we'll be ready to help you. You know, I, I always think of that. I think there's a Japanese proverb that says, you know, when the teacher is ready, the student, well, the student is ready, the teacher appears, you know? So I always think when the, when the patient is ready, the dentist appears, you know? So, um, so that's the, that's the, that's the way, you know, I say sometimes, you know, we just keeping them healthy, waiting for the good day to come for them and we'll be there when they're ready. You know, Pete, Pete used to call it money in the bank. Just when you, just when you've got a hole in your schedule, one of those patients will put their hand up and say, you know, I'm, I'm good to go, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, Absolutely. but we also got to be, uh, I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm sorry. But I love it. I love it. <laughs> Keep going. This is no. good stuff. But you know, we've also got to be careful that we, that we make sure the patients understand what it is that we want to do, that what it is we like to do for them. You know, I mean, uh, John always tells a, a great story. John Cranham tells a great story about the, you know, is patients thinking that you're a great patcher. And so, although it's, it's perfectly fine to keep someone in great shape, we just want to keep reminding them that we like to make beautiful smiles. We, we like to, these are the things that we, we would like to do for you given the opportunity, because even if it's not appropriate for them, you know, they'll tell their friends and then that's the sort of patients that they're going to refer to us. You know, one of my, one of my other mentors said to me, you know, he said, uh, always tell your patients the stories that you want them to tell other people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so I think it's, you know, dentists are, are, are not good. And I don't know that I was very good at doing that. You know, we sit there and we do what the patient asks and then we wonder why the work that we'd like to do isn't coming in. But when, but we don't tell anyone about what it is we'd like to do. So yeah. tell them consistently, you know, if you've got pals that like beautiful smiles, if you've got worn teeth, that's the stuff we like to do. But, you know, until then, we can keep you healthy. We're happy to do that. You know? Yeah. So. And I, I love the trends, you know, especially in Europe. I'm, I'm, I'm very biased because of the um, minimally invasive approach. I mean, you really do appreciate the natural beauty. And you, you said this, I love how you said this. You said, uh, minimally invasive doesn't mean no dentistry. Can you describe that? Well, yeah. I mean, that's one of the, you know, you see, you know, lots of things that we do tend to be like a pendulum, you know? So it's, it's like, okay. So at the moment we've got the old sleep apnea thing on, I know it's big in the States, you know, so I'm not going to say too much about this, Mm -hmm. but it's like, uh, nothing was to do with it. Now everything is to do with it. It's like right. the truth is probably somewhere in between, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's the same, you know, when when any trend comes along, we get some good things and we get some bad things. So when we had the smile design, we learned a lot of things about smile design. We learned a lot about adhesion. We learned a lot about porcelain. We learned a lot about, we actually gained a lot of uh, popularity, I think, with, with patients that we didn't have before. Um, mm. But like everything else, we tend to take it a step too far and we start preparing teeth too much. And before you know it, it's getting a little bit of a bad name. Well, the, the beauty is these days is, of course, that if we can get the teeth in the right position first, then what we need to do to restore the teeth is, is either minimal or, or, or non-existent. You know? So mm. it's, it's about understanding that we can do that, but it's also about understanding that sometimes 
a minimal approach might be very nice and might restore function, but it might not always give the patients the aesthetics that they'd like. Or, mm-hmm. or maybe we need to do a little bit more to achieve our goals. So I, I have a lot of patients with with worn down teeth and and and, and you no, know, don't get me wrong. We like to whiten teeth. We like to straighten teeth. We like to bond to them. That's the that's one of our favorite things. But mm-hmm. we we also have a lot of patients where the enamel is very cracked. And if we can whiten them till we're blue in the face, and then we can put some composite on the end, but the teeth still look cracked. And mm-hmm. and maybe we need to do we need to do a veneer on that case. So we need to do a crown on the, some of those cases. So it's about trying to understand really what the patient is looking for and then doing enough dentistry, as little as possible to solve their problem. Not, right. not too much, not too little, but just the right amount to solve their problems. And I think that's, the, to be honest, one of the things with complete tear dentistry, it's about, doing, it's about being able to do as little dentistry as possible to solve the patient's problems. Right, right. And then we often get in our own way more so than maybe the patient does. And that happens consistently. Now, you know, there's always the debate. We talk about composite when you talk about a crown. And I heard you say this too. We were talking when a crown fails, it, it fails in a catastrophic way. As where sometimes with composite, if it fails, um, not necessarily so. Can you, can you describe that too? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there is quite a lot of research out there that shows these things that when sometimes, you know, sometimes we get obsessed with the longevity of restorations, but when right. if, and but when we place that restoration, it might last a long time, but what happens when it fails? Maybe, mm. it, maybe it needs a root canal, maybe it needs an extraction, maybe we're going to have to do an implant. But the thing with composite is if it fails, you can repair it, you know? Mm. And, and so I think we need to think about uh, where we are in the patient's life and their expectation as well. Because if you've got a younger patient, you have to think about that restorative cycle. You right. have to think about how many times they might need to get those restorations done throughout their lifespan. lifespan. Mm. And you know, maybe being less invasive and maybe uh, being able to use composite maybe for at least a number of years to make them further along their life before they need to go for the bigger restorations is a good idea. So, you know, and I, I think one of the other things about it as well, Kirk, is, you know, when, you know, I, I think with complete dentistry, everyone thinks, oh, it's a full mouth rehab, it's 32 crowns or whatever it might be. And it, and it just so isn't that, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a full mouth consideration, you know, you need to think about everything that's there, but it doesn't yeah. mean to say that we have to crown every tooth in sight, you know? So, you know, the, the thing is that if we can uh, understand how to put this together and to think about the fact that we want this to last for the rest of the patient's life, mm-hmm. and we have to think about that restorative cycle and think about which is more important at the moment. Is longevity important or is repairability more important? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, and the other thing as a dentist is it, when you start off with some of these things, sometimes doing porcelain is pretty scary. You know, because if it fails, that's that's a lot of money to be involved in. Whereas with with composite, if it fails, most of us have got a tube of composite in the drawer that we can do something with. <laughs> now we, we might we might need to figure out why it failed and do something about it. But you know, it's 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 a much easier situation to cope with, and and certainly I had a uh, I think a lot of success over the years in building cases in, in composite. And then, you know, it made me feel that if this patient was ready to move to porcelain, you know, this was easy now because I knew it worked, you know? And right. so you feel better. The patient feels better. It's, it's certainly not a bad way to go. It's not, it's, it's not the only way I don't want, don't want anyone to think that, I mean, today I've done two porcelain cases, you know? So, yeah. I, but you know, it's certainly not a bad way to go when maybe you're not sure or the patient isn't sure. You know, and we can, the, the cool thing is that we can use all this beautiful composite material that we have now. We can use all the adhesive techniques that we have. And we can also use, you know, Dr. Dawson's principles, because if we can balance the forces that act on them, that's really how we get tremendous uh, longevity from those restorations. You know, I mean, composite is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that we don't have great composite guys in the States at all. You know, we've got some great guys over there. But, you know, we have, we have some real composite masters over here. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. You know, and I, I've been fortunate to spend some time with them. 
But a lot of them will say, well, we use you know, composite's great because it acts as a, a mechanical switch. If something's going to wear out, then the composite will wear out. Mm-hmm. And But a lot of them don't think about the forces that's acting on this. So they have cases which look beautiful, but maybe last three to five years, which is another reason why it gets a bad press. Right. But I think if we get the, the occlusion right and we manage the forces, you know, those cases will last a lot longer and we'll really do the patients a great service. So I think that combination of, you know, sort of maybe a little bit of composite artistry and some nice beauty is great, but we also will need to understand the mechanics and the engineering behind it. Yeah, and with all these factors, I mean, the materials get better all the time, exponentially better with the, and then, you know, I don't know what it's like in Europe, but the single biggest problem we have in this country is the aging population. While healthcare and the economy are a challenge, you know, people over here are just going to be living a lot longer. Um, One in three babies that's born today will actually live to be 100. So this debate, you know, I mean, you, you prep teeth in a person's you know, when she's 20, there's a good argument. She's going to live for 70 more years. So, yeah. so what do we do then? You know, so this is, this is a really, I love this conversation and uh, it's interesting, interesting to see what's, what's going to happen with these trends. Well, no, exactly. You know, and I, I, and I think it's, it is, you know, it is about the fact that people are, are living longer. They're lasting longer. I mean, my, my, my typical avatar of a patient is, is someone, you know, uh, uh, probably approaching 50 you know something like that and they've been drilled and filled over the years and i think they've got uh, sort of two pathways that they can go along which is either you know sort of i'm going to sort of lose my teeth and fall apart or you know what i'm trying to eat healthy i'm trying to exercise i'm trying to do all those things i, w- I want to keep my teeth in great shape and like you just said some, some of those patients will be around for 30 40 50 years so we we have to think about that we also have to think about you know when these patients get older, how are they going to manage those restorations? Are they going mm-hmm. to be able to? You know, there's a there's a lot of stuff now with implants, and and you know how, you know, when as we become less dexterous as we get older, how how is our cleaning going to be? How are we going to be ta- able to take care of those things? And there may be some challenges that we find as as time moves on. But I I, I think you know it's you know also as well one of the other things is if you think about it, you get patients. Uh, of that era that and maybe they're looking to to move towards a pension which they so they don't have new money coming in you know mm-hmm. and so you know w- we have to be you know more economical in our solutions you know we have to be thinking about how can we help them without costing a, a, a you know a fortune you know so there's there's lots of challenges in there and if we come back to the beginning of the spectrum as you say if you look at young people 20 years old and they've got challenges there you know, do we really want to put a set of veneers on those people if we could help it, if, uh, if maybe we could do something else? And I think, I think now as well with the, with, the, with the relationships, hopefully, that we have with the orthodontist and the, and, the, and the GDP ortho that we have, we've got no excuse to not get the teeth in the right place before we do stuff, you know? So, yeah. No, yeah, and it's, I, I love, you know, you could throw, I love the whole daughter question, you know, because you have daughters and I, you, you, would you do it on your, your daughter? And, you know, even with our orthodontist, I, he'll say, look, we're in no hurry. There's no hurry here. We've got to get this in the right place. And I, I think you're exactly right. When the teeth wow. are in the right place, we can, you know, no matter how good you are, it's not going to last for the rest of their lives as far as force. I mean, we can make that argument also too, with the forces that are happening, you know, that's a big deal. No matter how beautiful your dentistry is, the forces can outweigh any beautiful dentistry. Correct. Yeah, no, that, that, that is correct. I mean, obviously, you know, one of, one of, again, one of the things that Pete and other people have given us is, is, is great ability to be, to make it as predictable and re, as resilient and resistant as possible. Um, but you know, it's it's all it's always good to have something in your back pocket, something that right. you can uh, that you can pull out if necessary. And you know, I, I you talk about the door to test. You know, we, we you know uh, in Dawson, of course, we have that Widium rule. Would I do it on me? You know, and and, and we do call it the door to test, and they don't call it the wife test, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> and uh, right, uh, um, but you know, I think you probably know, Kirk, that my my daughter. Uh, she was born with a genetic disorder. She was uh, called uh, incontinentia pigmentia. And, and uh, when she was six weeks old, we were told she might be blind, deaf, mentally retarded, all these different things, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the good news is she's 21 years old now. And, uh, you know, she's got the, the it's a, it's a uh, neurocutaneous disorder. So she, uh, one of her challenges is that she has missing and misshapen teeth. 
Um, so this is sort of very personal for me as well. It's sort of one of the reasons I very selfishly got involved, you know. But when you see when you see these kids and you know they've got a whole lifetime ahead of them, you know how how and you know previously I'd see them and and with all respect to my orthodontic friends, they'd see the orthodontist first and the teeth would come and they'd be in completely the wrong position for mm -hmm. what I needed to do. And so to be able to get together with the orthodontist and say, look, I'm going to have to restore this. Let's get the teeth here. And then I can probably do either minimal prep or maybe even no prep restorations to make this work really well. And right. I think that, it, that, that to me is, is really how all this comes together. And, you know, I mean, it is exactly what I would do, and it is it is exactly what I'm doing for my daughter. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I I can't lie to other people about where this is going. I've done some direct bonding. I've done some no prep restorations. Yes, we've done some implants. We've done some orthodontics. You know, and but you know, and I'm very fortunate that uh, I have a great team that we work together to put the teeth in the right place. And so now, I mean, we're able to offer that service to to everyone else you know and, and and i think that for me this is this should be the way dentistry is that we right. um if we can work together to get the teeth in the right place so the so the restorative aspect is as as limited as, as small as possible you know if you I, well, it always it always it's like you know i was gonna say it makes me laugh it's a british expression but it's you, know, you see people talk about minimally invasive dentistry and you know as if this is a new thing and and then you go back to Pete's book and you think mm -hmm. about the treatment options and, the, and he's got his first option was to reshape or calibrate. The second one was to reposition. Third one was restore. Fourth one is surgery. And that, when I first saw that list, I thought, well, I'll choose restore because I like I got I got diamonds. I can I got a drill, you know, mm -hmm. but actually, if you think about them in that order, that is the way to practice minimally invasive dentistry. You know? mm -hmm. and, and I know. And I think that 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 sometimes people forget. Uh, what a great uh, prosthodontist Pete was, you know, with it, and he was a great aesthetic dentist as well. Um, so all those things have been around for a long time. Um, and I think it's about time that we embrace them properly, you know, and with the, with the materials that we have, that we don't really have any, any excuses anymore. Now, right. I'm going to give you one more thing, you know, about that, which is, you know, people then get obsessed about adhesion. You know, we, we can make, we can, we go, oh, this is great. We've got to stick to everything. But a lot of the teeth that I deal with, you know, some of them, they're just old denting there. It looks like concrete, you know, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't bond, you know, it's, you're not going to get much of a bond to that. So we have to understand traditional preparation. And then if we can blend that traditional preparation with adhesive preparation, then that's when we're going to get really real success. It's not one thing or the other it's a combination of the two. And very often, I'll even find that on the same tooth. So I might have some enamel left on the buccal wall that I can utilize for bonding. But maybe the palatal wall has disappeared and the, and the bottom is just like, is that horrible, shiny, dark dentine? I know. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe other people can bond to that. But I, I, think, I think I'm fooling myself to bond to that. So, but if we can combine the adhesion on the outside with traditional preparation on the inside, I think that's really how we're going to get the best results. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the myths that I see people attached to, especially younger dentists, is they think if I'm not prepping teeth all day, I'm not going to make a considerable income or living. But I find a lot of people that are practicing minimally invasive dentistry they're actually packaging beautiful solutions for patients, which patients pay very handsomely for and appreciate the fact that we don't have to destroy a lot of natural structure. You know? Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, that's a great point. Uh, Kirk. you know, I, I knew you'd bring it down to money in the end, but uh, it's, right. uh, it is important as well, but you know, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we do, I, I, I've got other practices and they, they earn, if you look at their grosses, it's very high, but mm -hmm. they have a massive laboratory bill, you know, and whiz is, you know, composite is not expensive, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it takes some time and you have to balance the time aspect against, uh, the, the, the material costs. But, you know, if, if you were able to be able to do this, I mean, this is a great service that you can provide, and it's a great way of making some 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 be, of being productive in your practice, and and it also means 
that you can offer this service to so many more people. You know? right. um, and that's going to be uh, a great practice builder for me, you know, um, because they, they, they know that it's not just about the money, you know, that, right. they, that you're there to provide a number of options. And if it's the economic option, then, then that's fine. I, I have patients where, you know, I know this get me struck off from pretty much everything I do, but they, you know, you, you put one shade of composite on and they think it's amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I got other patients where I spend hours stratifying a composite and, you know, they go, oh, I have this. And, you know, so it's, it's about understanding the patient and then managing their expectation as well. You know, so yeah. it's, and the, the key, the key is this for me. If we can get the design right, if we understand where the teeth need to fit in the patient's face, and then we can understand how they need to fit together in, in both statically and dynamically, then we can choose those. We can choose the tools and the and the materials that we use to to achieve that. And that's based on what the patient would like. It's based on the economic situation. It's based on the clinical situation. Um, and that way, I think we can treat a lot more people, and you know, we can grow our practice, and and we can also make this complete uh, uh, deal a, a reality. Right, right. And I want you to speak about that too, because I do believe that's the key also. Where do the where do the teeth fit in the face type of a thing? But the journey of a dentist, you know, if a young dentist is watching this and I'll just speak to, you know, I already know that. I already know I got it all figured out, but you don't really figure it all out. I mean, there are things that you learn all the time um, as you start to age and mature and maybe you've had a few failures. Can you just speak about that journey? Because you, even at your stage, you haven't completely figured out and mastered everything, have you? Oh, I don't. I don't think that any of us ever do. I, I, you know, I, I have a very small brain, and 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 most of it's filled with sport and things that I shouldn't probably think about. But uh, right, um, there's a small place for dentistry, and I, I try mm -hmm. and fit as much in there as possible. So you're always trying to learn more, you know. And I, I think, uh, I, I think the best thing that any of us can do is to be an eternal student. You know, you're always trying to learn more, always trying to find out the best things. Now, one, one of the things that we have to be wary of in dentistry is. I mean, obviously, I'm, I don't know so much about other other industries, but it's it's there's a lot of stuff comes on the market which is maybe not as tested as we think it is, mm -hmm. and, and and we get to be the we get to be the the trial for it, you know, right? And and and, and none of these companies ever come back to us and say, oh, if you if you get anything breaks, just let us know, you know? They, <laughs> yeah, they never do that. So no, nope. we've got to be sensible uh, about that. We've got to be an eternal student, always wanting to to learn more. But, you know, the other thing is that you see, say, let's say we see a beautiful smile and you, you see lots of people and they'll put it on the screen and, and it's three weeks old or maybe three months old. You know, I, I want to see things that are five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. And there aren't, there aren't many advantages in getting older, but it does mean that you see things and you see things, you see some things go round in a circle, you see some things progress. Um no, but one of the things that you see, and one of the great things about being a general dentist is you see how your patients do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you, and you see people, I saw, I saw a patient today and we'd actually done some work on referral and, you know, sort of five years later, she's, she came back to see us and you're thinking, oh no, what's happened to my five? <laughs> but mm -hmm. five years later, that work is looking very, very nice. And she'd actually come for us to look at something else, you know, right. because, uh, again, one of Pete's, you know, I, lo I love quotations because then I don't have to think about anything myself. But Pete used to always said was, we all have a reputation. It just depends what that is. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the reputation that I want. I want it to be a reputation where things last. And, you know, if we have another problem, then that's where we go back and we get those solved. But you do see things uh, over time uh, with experience. And, you know, I, I, it's, I don't know where the 30 years went, but I've been doing this for, for 32 years now. And you, you see things that work and you see things that didn't work and you you try and we, we, we all like evidence. Evidence mm -hmm. is great, but evidence has to blend with, with clinical experience as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a, there's a very interesting uh, article on, on uh, clinical evidence and it, and it says that clinical evidence can um, inform but can never exceed personal experience, and it, and that the, the 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 dentist or the or the doctor should also use clinical experience to judge whether the evidence applies to that patient. Right. You know? 
And that's a, it's a, an, an interesting thought. So I think evidence is really important, but you do see things over time and you start to see what works and what doesn't work, you know. And there's a few, th- I mean, one of the things that I know is that, I, you know, I, I was probably, for my American friends, cowardly. I built a lot of things in composite a long time ago. And I see a lot of it 15, 20 years on and it's still there, you know, mm-hmm. and patients, patients laugh at me. They said, oh, I, I, I'll spend the money one day. But, you know, they always stroke your ego for you. Say, oh, you did such a good job. You know, it's doing great, you know, but it's still there. Now, yeah. what, is, what is it that makes that stay there? But you also see cases, you know, I, I, I get to speak with, you know, and I, when, I'm, when I'm teaching with, with lots of different people and I, I see people and they take these worn teeth and then they put porcelain on them in exactly the same place. And then they mm-hmm. say, oh, you see, it doesn't work. And right. it's, uh, that's Einstein's first theory of insanity, to keep doing the same thing over and expect a different result. You yeah. know? So if, if it didn't work, what is it we could do to try and change this, to try and create a situation that might be more resilient for the patient? And that's really where all the occlusion and, and, and planning comes in. So... Yes, uh, experience is is, uh, is is great. Unfortunately, it brings age with it, which is less great. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, when you add up age and experience, and you talked about seeing things differently. You know, one of the things that I, I think is important to say is that there's nobody that's involved with people's health as much as a dentist is. And I think seeing the bigger picture here, you have the opportunity to guard the gateway to really the, one of the primary factors that makes people healthy or diseased here in the future. So, and especially with what's coming out with sleep and we're learning so much, I I would make the argument, no one's going to be as important as a dentist is long-term keeping somebody healthy. Now that would be a great debate, but it's true. I mean, you go to see a cardiologist, they're very much working you know, uh, reactively to most challenges. No one's working proactively. And so I think this is a great opportunity in dentistry. When you talk about affordable, complete care dentistry, it's bigger than the debate of, you know, porcelain or composite. I mean, there's there's the big picture here. And with age and your core values that come to the surface, this is really the most exciting time, I believe, ever to be involved in dentistry. No, oh, I, I think so as well. And you say there's there's no one else in healthcare professions who sees their patient maybe every three months, maybe right. six months or whatever it is. And, and you, you see how they are, you see how they change, you see how things develop. You know, sometimes you just see the patient come in and you say, they don't, you know, they don't like, look like they did last time. What's going on? And, you know, you can, you can pick things up like that. Sometimes there's clinical things that we can pick up. You get to know them, you know, that they, they go through the challenges in their life like we all do. Uh, and you can, you know, hopefully be supported to them. Um, but it's it's you know it's it's a great uh, I think it's a it's it's a great service, but it's also um, it's a great position to be in to 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 be able to see people develop throughout their lifetime and to try and help them stay healthy, you know. And mm-hmm. and 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 I do think you know I mean we know how important um, dental health is to the rest of the body. We know how we can pick things up that's going on in there that might be affecting. We know how sleep apnea impacts and all these things. And I think we're in such a privileged position to be able to do that, that when we talk about complete care dentistry, you know, Whit Wilkerson talks a lot about total wellness dentistry, you know, and I, I think that's a, a fabulous thing to be able to do. I, thought, I don't think there's anyone in as good a position to be able to help our patients uh, stay healthy, you know, and, mm. uh, you know, I, you know, sometimes it's just like, oh, okay, you know, you put on a few pounds, you know, it's like, oh, okay. You know, yeah. I, I, I had a patient a few months ago, you know, maybe I'm not the most uh, subtle person. Patients like to tell me, you know, oh, you, you stopped playing rugby and you're looking a bit, you know, <laughs> bigger than yeah. you used to. You know, so, but, you know, sometimes you see patients and you say that. And I had one guy came in, he'd lost, he'd lost a stone and a half. And he said, you know, I, I said, wow, you look great. You know, he said, well, what we'll brought that on? He says, well... He said, you know, that, that chair creaked when I got in it last time, you know, that, oh, that yeah. so, you know so, so it's, I, I think it is so important that we, we're, we're in this very privileged position. And when we talk about complete care dentistry, sometimes, you know, to, 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 to be a complete care dentist costs nothing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, Pete has always said, and I, I, I just could not agree more with him that everyone deserves the right to a complete examination everyone right. deserves the right to know what's going on and then you know we all know that human nature is that we don't fix everything 
when we when we should. You know, sometimes we let things go on a little bit. You know, I, I often use the the uh, um, the example of Perio. You know, I, I, you know, maybe it's just me, but I, I I'm never no one's ever 100 percent successful in getting everyone to take on the Perio program that they need to do. You know, right. and that that sometimes you'll see you'll see someone who's really well maintained, and then something happens. And, you know, it's not just because they stopped cleaning their teeth. Maybe there's something else in their life that has happened, or maybe there's a general health issue that's impacting on their – and I, th- I think we're in a great place to be able to help them with that. We're the, we're the people that see that. But the only way we can do that is to the, embrace that complete examination, let people know what it is that's going on, let them know what it is that, that we could help them with, and then let them know that when they're ready, we'd be glad to help them. Yeah. Now that's probably the cornerstone to really complete care. I've heard Pete say it so many times, but let me throw you the questions that I hear. Young dentists might say, well, Ian, my patients don't want a, you know, comprehensive exam. You know, what do you, what do you say to that? Cause I, I have a feeling of what you're going to say, but I want to, I want to toss you the hard questions that I get. No, I mean, that, that, that's perfect. You know, I mean, it's one of those things that one of, one of, without I try not to get drawn on too much of a tangent, but one of, one of the things that I see you know, in every country that I go to, and I'm very fortunate to uh, travel the world with dentistry, is that often we get dictated to by the system that we're in. Mm-hmm. And, and and we do what the system is telling us. So, uh, you know, on the National Health Service, you know, basically, you, uh, not, not necessarily now, but maybe in the past, we got a small fee for doing that. So a small fee equates to a small amount of time. So how have I got time to talk that? I know you all have a lot of managed care, you know, mm-hmm. Um so, you know, how am I going to be able to do that? Well, you just have to find a way of being able to have those conversations. And you, and you would just be amazed that not only will you be able to help the patients, but you'd be amazed at the work it will generate for you. And, right. you know, I, I think, you know, you, the, the, in uh, most of these practices, you know, the, the biggest, I always say, if you said, because a lot of dentists will say that to me. I said, your biggest problem is that if you go to work tomorrow and you say to your patients, do you want me to just take care of this tooth? Or do you want me to give you a complete plan for the, that's going to keep you in great shape for the rest of your life? If half of your patients say yes to the second one, you're never going home again. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. I said, there is so much work out there that, you know, you know again, it's one of the things I, I, I learned from Larry Gazzardo, you know, it's like we talk to the believers as well. You know, if someone's not ready, that's okay. Yeah. You know, we can keep them healthy. So we would talk to them about the, the, you know, they would maybe be a biologic patient. So it's, it's what we, you know, hopefully on our courses, um, you know, we show uh, methods and, and procedures and ways and systems that allows you to start to build this into your practice and, and allows you to really start to, uh, communicate with patients better, whether it's through questionnaires, maybe that they fill in before they get there, whether it's it's people talking in hygiene, you know, mm-hmm. that, that creates an atmosphere in the practice that allows these things to come out. You know, right. so, you know, I mean, there's, there's, so there's that aspect, which is about uh, the practice and, and the practice growth and all those things. But actually, what is it? You know, we go back to that question, you know, would I do it on me? When do you right. go to see someone what do you think that they're doing for you? Do, do you want them to not tell you things? Mm-hmm. Or would you like to tell them everything that's there so that you could make an informed decision about whether you want to deal with it or not? You know, yeah. I, you know, I just think that we owe everyone uh, that, that, that right. I think everyone has that right for that. And you know what? It's just, it's just learning to be able to do that relatively quickly. It really doesn't take long to check people's teeth. I think most people do that. It yeah. really doesn't take long to check their gums. If you don't do that, you'll be in trouble. Um, and you know, it doesn't take long to check for cancer. If you don't do that, they might die. That's quite serious. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we like to spend lots of time talking to them about their smiles. It's funny. We can find the time for that, you know, right, right. Uh, which, which is great. I like that too. But you know, if we talk to them as well about how's the joints, how's the muscles, how's it all working out, we really start to get that complete package, you know? And it, so I don't think, I actually don't think that there's much missing from most people's exams. It's just about helping the, very often as well in that examination, we do the examination to the patient. And you know, you, we all know the, the term co-diagnostic exam. And mm-hmm. the, often, whether, whether you're doing a full exam or whether you're doing a simple exam, the, the thing is we're doing it to the patient, you know? Mm-hmm. And they don't get 
any value from it. Whereas if we can engage with them and let them know about what it is we're looking for and then how they compare to that, that's really how we're going to get success. Yeah, and that's a really good point that you just brought up because I would totally agree if we can just get them to the complete, you know, the comprehensive exam. Pete used to say this years ago, you have a practice within your practice, maybe two practices within your practice. And we see it every time, you know, we're coaches when we go into an office. I mean, there's just, there's so much dentistry that hasn't been discussed, talked about, photographed, you know, uh, and then we could even retroactively, I mean, you could move all the way up here to show how much opportunities in dentistry, half of the general public in the United States doesn't go to the dentist. There's tremendous opportunity there. Diagnosis is 25 to 24% in the United States, which means of all the patients that are seen by a dentist today, only 24% of them are going to have anything documented about what needs to be done. So you've just got tremendous opportunity here. And P, I remember Pete used to say this, you don't ask people if they want to do a comprehensive exam. It's just part of who you are and yeah. it's part of how you help them keep their teeth. So I think when you give it and make it an option, you know, do you want the best food here or should I just make something up real, you know, real quick and just give you less than the best? Um, that's where the whole thing lies right in there. Well, I think as, I think as well, you know, I mean, I, I remember sitting in class and, you know, I remember Pete and probably other people saying, you know, this will really differentiate you from everyone else. And, mm -hmm. you know, these days we get all these smart people telling us, um, you know, that, oh, you should have this on social media. You should be doing this. You should be this. And you, you can you can be the, the, the spa practice. You can I, all these different things, mm -hmm. you know, but but I, I have to say that that we do get so many patients who say, uh, no one's ever examined me like that. And that's, that's in a good way, you know? Right. <laughs> so, and, 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 you know, it is also about what sort of patients are you looking for? We, we can't be all things to all people, you know? Right. And, and I, I in the UK, and I, I'm sure you have it over there, you know, we have lots of practices and it's a free exam, free CBCT, this, 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 and then we're going to sell you some dentistry, you know? Yeah. It's, it's not what I do. It's not who I am. And, you know, so this is what we're going to do. And, and, yeah. and then you get a reputation for doing that and you attract the patients who want that sort of service. I right. don't, I, I don't attract the, the people who want the cheaper stuff. Mm -hmm. I know they, they, they know that's not necessarily going to be the case, but we attract people who want quality and who want value for what they do. Right. Um, and you know, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's so obvious. I mean, again, you talk about experience, it, it's, it's a real slow burner to do that. You know, it's, it's so much easier to sell your, sell your practice as being this or that. It's a slow burner to develop your practice the way you want it to be, mm -hmm. but it, it will last you a lifetime, you know, because yeah. patients understand who you are, how you go about your business, what it is you're looking to do. And then you just get more of those patients. You, you yeah. don't get, I, I don't get so many tire kickers. I don't get the, because they know that's not what I do. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and, and that way I, I just want to go to work every day and be myself, you know, tell some stupid jokes, uh, you know, be nice to people, hopefully have them be nice to me. You know, and uh, our, you know, what we're looking for in the patients is someone who turns up, uh, says thank you and, and pays us some money. And that's all that's, you know, they're just nice to us and go home again. And then we try and attract more of the same, you know, it's yeah. like, and, and that way we get, uh, we get a nice practice. You know, we, we, we're not, we're not after the ones who pay your money and then couldn't care less, you know? So, yeah. um, and the other thing that I meant to say before as well is we always tell the patients there's two parts of treatment. One is doing the job. And then the second part is, is looking after it. And the patients that do the best are the ones where we take care of you afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, that, that really is, uh, you know, where, when you talk about experience, that really is where you see the, the proof of the pudding. And you, right. you know, you see things that you've done and you think that was a good day or that was less than a good day, you know? Right. But you, but you start to understand what's working, what's not working, how did we do it? And you start to understand how to keep rolling that out to get the best results for patients. So, mm -hmm. but, but certainly regular hygiene, regular care, making sure that everything's a stitch in time, you know, if there's a problem, you fix it and it's dealt with rather than waiting five years before it falls apart and you get to do it all again. You know, these are all the things that, that we do and we, 
we, we try and let our patients know that so that they become regular attenders, which then, like you said before, leads to us being able to get to know them and to help them. And they become our best referrers then. Absolutely. And being very intentional about that, too, because you do attract more of these types of patients. And, you know, we just got a comment from Julie, who's a hygienist. She says, as a dental hygienist, when I'm doing a pre-interview on a new patient in our practice, I ask the patient about how well they sleep at night, which is a great question to ask in hygiene. There aren't many hygienists that ask that question. And how is their digestive system, stomach problems? Do they feel they're able to chew on both sides of their mouth? And of course, you know, she says her patients are surprised and happy at these questions and they lead to what's really happening in their mouths. And Julie, that's a great point because what you st start to do with a deeper understanding of them, they understand you and then you start to build a practice just like that. And that lends itself to just a, a lot of affordable, complete care dentistry. I think, I think the hygienist is in a, a, a really favorable position. You know, I think right. maybe, maybe I have a, a, a perverted view, you know, um, my wife used to be a hygienist you now, but so I can't say too much. But uh, uh, I think that, that sometimes they think the dentist is looking to sell them something, whereas mm -hmm. whereas the hygienist is there to take care of them, you know, and, and right. they know that they're very much on their side. And, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it's absolutely golden to have someone like Julie in your practice who's asking those questions, who's concerned about the patient, who can try and help them, who's then going to say, oh, you right. want to speak to Dr. So-and-so about that? You know, I mean, that that is absolutely golden. But, you know, if you've got someone like that, you're incredibly lucky. And if you don't have someone like that, it might be because they're not like that. It might be because you've never told them that that's how you'd like them right. to be, you know, and very often we don't share with them. This is what I'm like you to be talking to the patient about. This is what I like you to be looking for. This is how I see the practice. I want you to subscribe to that, you know, mm -hmm. that because if they don't want to be like that, if they just want to give people a spring clean, then maybe, maybe, maybe that's one where you can help them with their future, you know? So, yeah. um, but you know, I think, I think it's great. And I think hygienists, I mean, hygienists really are, no, the the ones they see them six weeks, twelve weeks, whatever it might be, and and the, most of them, so it's a great create a great relationship with the patients, and they see how their health is responding. So I think it's great, Julie, if you if you're doing those things, and I really would encourage everyone who's in that position to be able to do that. Right, and if you're watching this, you know that you know how true this statement. It's having a great team is critical to your survival in dentistry, and the question always following that up is, what do you do? to create the great team. You know, everybody would agree with the first statement, but the second one is the hard part. You know, how do you educate these people to communicate the way that you would really want them that reflects the, the vision of practice? Now, Ian, I want you to talk about this too. There are pitfalls when you go down this path of creating, you know, affordable, complete care dentistry. What are some, if I'm a young dentist watching this, what are some lessons you've learned over and over again, just, you know, that you would share with us when you're on this path? Well, Certainly, I mean, one, I say one of the biggest lessons was just when I, when I went along the complete care dentistry pathway, um, mm. which is, is that some patients, I probably made some patients feel as though they didn't belong in the practice. Mm. I know it, it's the, the first thing that you want to do. We talk about them being general patients and complete patients. And, and that's sort of when a patient walks in the practice, you're just trying to work out, is this more of a biologic patient or is this someone that needs the extra attention? Mm. And now the thing is, they may need the extra attention, but do they want the extra attention? And if mm -hmm. they if they don't want it, that's okay. They just go back into the general pile, you know? So we we need to establish that and we need to make everyone feel as though they're welcome in the practice right. and that we're but we need to let them know what it is. So those are those are, they need to know what it what it is that we want to do and that when if they if they're ever ready to do some more, we'll be there and ready to help them. So that's that's probably the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Uh the number number two thing is to say, you know we'd be glad to help you get this done and you know we we don't mind how long it takes you know it, it, we, we're going to find a way of being able to do this for you that's going to suit you and suit your pocket and you know some to be honest with you some of the the most rewarding cases are the ones where we've had to get them set up and then we've maybe done some temporary restorations or composite restorations mm -hmm. and then we've done two this year and two next year and, and then you come to the day where you go and we're done and it's like maybe five years down the line and the patient says well what are we going to do now I go, well we could start again <laughs> no, yeah. no so we can but we're now we're going to keep you well no that's the thing but those i i, I find those cases so so rewarding and the the key to that is if we can get you know i mean talk about the occlusal aspects if we can get them 
uh, understand what their complete needs are and then get CR equal MI, make it work for them so that then we can take that apart one tooth at a time, two teeth at a time, whatever it might be, then that's how uh, we're going to be successful. Um, mm. But very often we, 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 we do this one here and then they want this one done and we, we, we built a flat tooth there so now we have to build a flat tooth there and yeah. it just gets all out of whack. So we... That's something else that we want to do is to is to not is to not be bothered about how long it takes and to help people on that journey. And then with minimally invasive stuff, the thing that you, the never mind minimally invasive, maybe everything that we do in dentistry, the most important thing is to manage the patient's expectations. Mm. And one of the one of the pitfalls that you you mentioned the word pitfall of of, of minimally invasive dentistry is. Sometimes, sometimes minimally invasive is cost effective, and sometimes it isn't cost effective. Sometimes it's not. Ex it's you know, doing a really thin, beautiful veneer is not the cheapest thing in the world. You know, mm -hmm. and you know, and and it's it might be more risky. But we need to. But we do get patients, and actually, they really want the best aesthetics, but they choose the lesser material because it's less expensive. And then you get in a hole because they thought they were getting this and we provided that. And mm -hmm. so one of, one of the things that, that we always do uh, is we have case examples, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it, it, we, we try and be very explicit about the fact that if, you know, if we're going to do porcelain, maybe this is how it's going to look. If it's going to do composite, this is how it's going to look, you know? And we let them see examples of what it is that we're doing so that they understand what it is. And, you know, the the, the old adage, better to under-promise and over-deliver, mm -hmm. is always is always a good place to be. But that is that is is perhaps the biggest challenge that I see in minimally invasive dentistry is people expecting too much from what right. we're trying to achieve, you know? So be very. I'd rather spend... I'd rather spend more time up front having them understand what it what the limitations are than spend time at the end explaining why it's not what they expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very, very important. And also, too, maybe sometime in another, we can talk about how you do that because people sometimes only remember what they want to remember when you have these conversations, correct? No, that's yeah. absolutely right. You know, I, I, I say that a lot in our teaching as well because, you know, there's a big difference between what you say and what people hear. You know? right. and, and you've got to, you've got to remember that you've got a very firm picture in your mind about what this means to you, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily understand that. And so, yeah. the better that we can share that with them, whether it's a visual, um, you know, I tell a lot of stupid stories, you know, and uh, you know, but I, I got to find a way of helping them understand about what it is that we're doing. And yeah. you no, know, certainly, certainly, as you as you build. Uh, a, a catalog of cases that becomes a great way you know where you can say look here's one we did before here's here's the porcelain here's this this is how it works out you know i don't know which is appropriate for you you know so you you let me know which you, those you'd like you know so right. but you know uh, one of the things is i mean we have a you know again perhaps one of the things that we've uh, um gained from our beautiful american friends is is legal cases lawsuits mm -hmm. you know and oh, yeah. You know, we have to be very, very careful about that. We have to be very concerned about informed and valid consent. Um, mm. And I, I think one of the one of the keys, well, two keys that I would say is one is having a process for complete dentistry, and so it takes them on a pathway that there is predictability in there. So, well, I mean, today, I mean, one of the my patients this afternoon, you know, it's it's a it's a veneer case looks pretty good but she wants to make some changes i go well that's fine you know let's just make those changes we'll do that and then so i made the changes sent her away give her another week because i wanted to come back and say you know Ian, if you make them like that i'll be happy mm -hmm. and that way that way that it becomes very very predictable you know right you know i mean one of the i get I talk about mistakes or things not to say don't worry about that the lab will fix it you know oh yeah and, don't ever say that no, I mean, yeah. if, if you can't fix it with the patient and their lips and their cheeks and their teeth in, in front of you, don't expect the, the lab to fix it with a piece of stone in front of them. Right. You know? So we have to get those things right. We have to get the landmarks in place so the lab understands where it is. And then, you know, I mean, it, it is one of those things. It's only once you do it 
and you see these cases come back and it goes in bang 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 and you think why did i not do this before mm -hmm. and and why would they ever stop doing it and occasionally we all have we all have um uh, aberrations we all have times when maybe we you know again one of pete's sayings the, the the longest way is always the shortcut you know and something comes back and you think okay that's why i do what i do <laughs> mm -hmm. so you know there, there's i mean Digital technology now is amazing in so much as, you know, we get, we can scan the provisionals, we can scan the preps, we can click those together. It's so, so predictable. Amazing things, how we can combine that traditional pathway with new technology and get mm -hmm. fabulous results, you know, but, you know, it's, it's, it's about that predictability level and we can make sure that the patient is happy before we get, we go to that finish. That's always a, a key thing to do. Yeah, buddy, this is awesome. I always enjoy anything we talk about. So now I know people are going to have questions when when they're watching this. Um, they can always check out the Dawson courses. You have the BD seminars in the UK. But Ian, um, this is also going to be on iTunes. If somebody's listening to this, how can we get a hold of you? I, I mean, I'm, I'm fairly visible on on uh, on the interweb these days, but uh -huh. you can Anyone can email me. I don't mind. My email address is i i buckle at buckleadc.com. Or you can go on my practice website, which is buckle, buckle Advanced Dental Care. Just look that up and send me an email through there, and we we get back to you. Um, you know, I mean, one of one of the one of the coolest things, one of the the, the greatest things. Uh, I know I I hope Cranham's not listening because I don't want him to get too excited. But <laughs> we oh, won't tell. Him. No, don't tell him anything. But, yeah. you know, one of the best things was when I spoke to him about stuff, he wanted to help me, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I'd like to think that I've always been like that anyway. Mm. But, you know, that's the way we need to be. You know, if someone right. if someone would like help, why, why could we not help them, you know. And right. so, you know, if anyone wants to get in touch, I'd be glad to try and help them however I can. You know, I, I say that the nicest thing about the the being involved in what I've been doing over the years is, is the great people who have been so willing to share their expertise and their knowledge. And, and, and the other thing about that is, you know, someone told me a while ago, give all your best ideas away. Then you have to think up new ones, you know? Right. And it's, uh, it is, it is true. You know, it's, you may as may as well do it, you know? So, and it, if you think it's a great message, you know, you just want to spread that message and encourage people to get involved. So if, yeah. if, if anyone would like to get in touch, I'd be glad to help them. Um, and then we can try and put them in the right direction, wherever, whatever, whichever is going to be the best pathway for them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your ideas are never that good up here. Get them out there if they're good ideas. Also too, I'm just going to give you the tough questions. I get, I know this applies for the Dawson Academy, uh, in uh, on the u.s soil but also in the uk people say well i've already done a lot of training do i have to go back through and do it all i mean what what do you say to that well i mean actually i had a, a i did a, a lecture at the weekend and uh, there was a lady there and she's i'm from argentina and we do all this stuff at undergraduate level and i'm like oh, yeah. okay that, sound, that sounds great you know i mean because you know and we've heard it before and then sometimes it's like maybe you have maybe you haven't you know so but you know some people have done a lot of great stuff and um you know, they understand a lot of things. And I, I, I understand why there's a, a reticence to suddenly think I need to engage with all those things. Well, mm -hmm. what I what I what I would say is 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 perhaps two things. First of all, uh, maybe go along to one of the seminars, listen to one of the seminars online and see uh, and see uh, how it relates to you. See if you think you know that stuff already or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the hands on thing, I, I, I think the best thing you can do is go along to the treatment planning module and you'll you'll find out whether you really understand the records and the examination that you needed to get there mm -hmm. and then i think one of the things that's pretty unique about uh, the dawson process is um the, the 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 is literally the process and the step-by-step -step fashion in which we treatment plan cases mm -hmm. uh, we you know i am um, john and drew uh, came up with the dawson diagnostic wizard which is a great uh, cloud-based uh, um, help to us all now as well mm -hmm. um I think if you go on that course, you'll really get an understanding about what we're about and you really understand um, the process involved and you'll, you'll be able to evaluate and we'll be able to evaluate for you as well whether you need to go back and 
revisit the records, whether you understand about equilibration, whether how much you understand about aesthetics, and we can see where you could fit into that program. Because, you know, as I say, I think we, we, we would all say we want to help anyone that would like to be helped and mm -hmm. anyone that wants to come up. I think, but that's a great way of getting involved. And then we can make sure that you're going to get the best education that we can help you with. One, one of the biggest dangers is that we... You know, we do get. I I, I had a, a dentist say to me the day, "Oh, do you have advanced programs?" Because, uh, you know, I've done a lot of stuff, and now I want to just come on an advanced program. We do have advanced programs. We have a lot of great things, but there's there's nothing worse than seeing someone sitting in your class and it's all just going over their head because right. they didn't get what it was, and that's a that's a waste of everyone's time. And we really don't we really don't want that to happen. So get along to treatment planning, see what's going on. Also, as well. Um, at Dawson Academy in the States, they have some great people. Give them a call, tell them what it is you're doing, uh, and they'll give you some great advice about about where we can do this. Maybe get you to speak to sort of one of the mentors or assistants, and and uh, they could give you some great help about where that would be. Yeah, absolutely. What's bigger than the information or the education is the people. People are uh, tremendous. Absolutely. So, um, and that's the the thing I think about the most. So, thank you, buddy. I really really appreciate you being on here. And again. Uh, you and I are just going to have a regular coffee talk or, <laughs> or in the evening, you might be opening up a beer over there. Who knows? I don't know. I, I just appreciate you, buddy. So thank you so much. Um, and stay on for a second, Ian, while we say goodnight to everybody else. Um, I really appreciate this, my friend. So uh, thank you for watching the Best Practices Show. We are crazy, crazy grateful you're watching. If you enjoyed today, do me a favor. Just hit the share button and share it with your friends because obviously we'd love for you to share the information. And again, keep giving us feedback about things you want to see. So until we see you next time, keep watching the Best Practices Show. You guys have a great evening.